How does a guy with no formal audio training start making gold records with some of the most sought after bands in the industry? Hey guys, Graham here from TheRecordingRevolution.com and last week I got to sit down with famed producer, engineer, and mixer Joey Sturgis, famous in the metalcore genre, worked with bands like Asking Alexandria of Mice and Men, The Devil Wears Prada, and he pulled back the curtain on his approach to getting killer sounding records with really affordable equipment in the box approach, no vocal booth, no big studio. He works in living rooms, bedrooms, garages, but also his insanely encouraging story as a guy who was a drummer with no recording background to making records with bands that got signed in some other dude's garage with some other dude's equipment. He didn't even have his own equipment. His whole approach to fiddling with things until it sounds right and not understanding what a compressor does but still just tweaking the knobs until he got a cool sound is insanely encouraging. He'll show you that if he can do it, you can do it. And he'll show you that the, the common denominator for his success was never the gear or even his formal background because he had neither of those. I love his approach. He's a great example of this recording revolution we're living in. And he was very generous to share everything he does, how he does it, how he approaches it. A super down to earth and humble guy, not holding anything back. I think if you watch this interview, you will learn a lot, but more importantly, you'll be motivated to actually get out there and start making music instead of making excuses, and that's what I'm all about. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this very, very packed, but very, very fruitful interview with Joey Sturgis. Hey friends, Graham here from TheRecordingRevolution.com. Happy to have uh, one of my newer friends join us this week, Joey Sturgis, um, engineer, mixer, producer, entrepreneur, plug-in developer, uh, fellow Creative Live instructor. Um, he's taught a whole class on mixing on Creative Live, which we can talk about at the end. And also, he's done a studio pass, which is really, really cool. Love Creative Live and love what he's done there. Um, Joey has worked with bands like Asking Alexandria, Of Mice of Men, uh, Devil Wears Prada. He kind of, if, you, if you're into metalcore or, or really heavy, aggressive music, aggressive drums, guitars, vocals, he kind of has that genre down to a science and he's really good at what he does. He's a very young guy and he's also a home studio organically developed engineer. So he has a very cool story that I think many of you will identify with. So um, I was honored to jump on his podcast, the Joey Sturgis podcast with the whole crew a few months ago and I wanted to return the favor and introduce him if, if he's new to you, to my audience. And so Joey, thanks for hanging out with us today and sharing some of your story. Hey man, thanks a lot for having me and uh, thanks for the very kind an awesome intro. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's easy, man. I, I love, I love uh, your story because you're obviously very good at what you do. So I respect the the quality of your work, and I love what we do because it's a it's like a craft. So it's like one craftsman watching another person's craft and saying, "Oh, I like I like what you've created. You do good work." But more importantly, I think you're just a really laid back, personable, down to earth human being that you seem more musician focused a lot of times than engineer focused. You're, you seem just like a person who loves making music and uh, that resonates with me and my audience and I, lo I love guys like that. So we're happy to have you, man. That's great, yeah. Um, well, you know, I come from a very musical family. Uh, everyone in my family can play instruments or sing and um, it was just natural to be involved in any kind of music and it never really came to me as like, oh, this is something that I'm going to set out to do and make my career. You know, I'm, I'm going to go and record bands. I never thought that or never, you know, actually what I was trying to do was be a computer programmer and uh, I was, you know, going full force for that. I was in special classes for that and I had a job where I was working at a computer shop and, and doing things like that. So, um, this just sort of happened to me and luckily I, you know, I had a knack for it. I was good at it. There was a skill there. And, and it's funny because my uncle actually does this professionally for a living in Nashville. Oh, cool. And I, so I never looked at him and was like, oh, I want to be just like my uncle. It was just like, oh, my uncle Dan, he records in Nashville. He's cool. Um, so I just ended up doing the same thing as him and it, it you know it's been interesting because there's been times where I've been in Nashville and uh, working and he comes by the studio or whatever and says wow this is really weird <laughs> 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 to see little Joey like little Joey running the whole studio you know so <laughs> that's awesome man um, so I want to get into your story in, in a minute could you maybe um, how would you describe the type of music that you work on that you prefer to work on and you're interested in 
Right. So the the type of music that I work on that I'm most known for is generally called metalcore, um, but it's kind of the clash of you know taking really aggressive music and mixing it with the ideologies of pop. You know, they still have the verse, chorus, bridge um, structuring in in some of the songs, not all of them, and it, it still has the. Um, I guess you would even consider that it has some of the same chord progressions but the sound of it is just so much more aggressive and and more intense mm. and uh it's all about conveying a very strong passionate um idea or emotion and so sometimes we're doing it in very creative ways uh like one of the things that i think i was kind of known for was i would take like a really rhythmic aggressive um what what we call a breakdown, which is you know guitars palm muting at the same time as a kick pattern type thing, and put like a symphony over it, and mm. people would just be like, "Whoa, that's crazy! Where did that come from?" So awesome. that co you know comes from the love of a film and cinematic and and that marriage uh, with the love for metal and aggressive music and kind of just you know push them together and, and try to come up with something that is interesting. So yeah, cinematic is a good word. I mean, it, it does remind me of. Like scoring a film is just really aggressive and a real aggressive a film. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like well, strings can be intense. You know, the orchestra can be intense, and so you're kind of doing that with guitars and drums. It's like multi-layered intensity, uh, which yeah. is what you get. You know, when you watch something like Transformers, you've got the intenseness mm. of the music and the yep. intenseness of the sound effects, and the acting and the special effects and the CG and all this stuff. So that was my first sort of inclination. Was like, how big can I make a song? And my goal was always to try and make the artist try to try to portray the artist in a comic book character version of what they do. Oh, like, that's cool. Like the super, you know, this vocalist, he's done this, this, and this. Let's make him the superhero that he is now. Yeah. And see how big we can make him sound. So that that was kind of my approach to to production and kind of also the definition of what the style of music is that I work on. Oh, I love it. That was a great explanation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I want to talk in a, in a little bit about some of the unique approaches to that style of music because it, it is it is has a signature sound, and so there's some different things that you're doing. I know in the recording and definitely in the mixing phase. But um, let's before we get there, give us a, a rundown of your story. You're a guy that's doing this now. You've got, I mean, you know, you've got a, a plug-in company. You've got a record a record company. You, you, you're producing bands, recording bands, or mixing bands. Um, you're you're educating on how you get your sound. So you're doing music, you're doing production, you have a studio, you 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 do this professionally, but you didn't go to audio school. Correct. Yeah. So let's rewind and start. Yeah. I guess all the way back at the beginning. How, so, how did you get? How did you, how did you get to where you are today? I think your story is, is unique. It's cool. So point A to point B. Um, well, as I said, I started off in the musical family. So naturally, I was in bands when I was a kid. Um, now, I'm not the typical guy that ended up in a band when he was 14. I ended up in a band when I was eight. So I was kind of offset in that regard where I would be the eight or nine-year-old playing drums and everyone around wow. me in the band was maybe 22 to 30. Like the how age, did, how the does age. that happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when you're a musical family, you know everybody in mm. the town and mm -hmm. everyone that likes music has seen your mom and dad play and has seen your brother and your cousin and I don't have any brothers I'm an only child but you know what I mean so yeah. um I just naturally would end up at parties with my parents and they would say hey come up and play a song you know you know this Jimi Hendrix song right yeah so here I am playing the Jimi Hendrix song and lo sooner or later I'm in a band and uh so long story short, I, I played drums a lot. Uh, I learned how to play guitar, but I never really in, entered a band as a guitar player. So okay. I was always the drummer in okay. whatever band I was in. So I got into this band, and we started getting a little serious. Uh, this was around the age of, I'd say, like 18. Um, and we were like, okay, we need to record a demo and put it online so people know what we sound like, because then, then we'll be able to get shows. Yeah. And this was when MySpace was taking off. So. Yeah. I, record, I uh, basically, one of my friends had a garage that he had converted into a makeshift studio. He had some home, home recording gear. And you have to remember that back then, home recording was not 
popular or even viable yeah. um, as an option. I mean, there there just were, there was not very many interfaces that you could use. The gear was hard to come by. You know, most people had to go to a big studio to do a demo or even a recording. So, I uh, I asked him. I said, "Hey, um, I know you work really early in the morning and you're never really awake." you know, at like 2 a.m., but I am. It Would it be cool if I could come in here and just kind of mess around with your stuff? I mean, I won't break anything. Um, I just want to play around with, with the stuff you got because uh -huh. I'm, I'm kind of interested in this. And he was like, sure. So he gave me a key, and uh, I would go in there around midnight to, to about 7 a.m., which is when he would go to work, and uh, then I'd sleep through the day. And uh, so I'd play around with the stuff, and I finally got to a point where I was kind of comfortable, where I could like use it. I could at least press record, and I knew how to mic stuff up and kind of turn a couple knobs. I didn't know what I was doing at all, yeah. just trying to get stuff on the computer. And we recorded a demo, and the first demo that we recorded, we just posted it on MySpace, and it was just like, here it is. And uh, the next thing that happened was all these people from the tri-state area were noticing this recording and they were messaging us on MySpace saying, hey, we love this demo that you guys did. Where did you record it? Ah. And the vocalist at the time, uh, he was running the MySpace. So he would reply and say, oh, our drummer did it. Um, you know, you should talk to him or whatever. So I asked my friend, the original friend that let me use the space. I said, "Hey, uh, I've got people that like want to come record with me, and they're willing to pay. Are you cool with that?" That's awesome. <laughs> and uh, you so know, it wasn't was, even your studio or your stuff. Right, right. I it, love it. It wasn't my gear. I had nothing. I was just a dude in a garage, and uh, it wasn't my garage either. So <laughs> he's he's like, "Yeah, just give me a little. You know, give me like ten percent." And uh, you can take it. So I did that for a while. I think we l did that deal for a good year, a year or so before it started to become, you know, an issue. And uh, that's when I started to rent the place. So mm. I actually took up a lease or a rent on it. And uh, that that's when I started to connect and network a lot because I had to work with all the you know the tri-state bands and the, their friends and their friends and their friends and the yeah. web effect started to happen yeah. and um, eventually I ended up at a show and I saw this band playing and I was just amazed by what they were doing because they, what they were doing at that time was so different to what the Midwest was used to and the, the band is the Devil Wears Prada mm -hmm. so I talked to them after their set and I was like hey uh, I got a recording studio <laughs> and uh, would you would you guys like to come record with me? And I talked up a big game and showed them like stuff that I'd done. And they're like, "Hey, man, it sounds great, but <laughs> no offense, no we offense. want we want to do this by ourselves." And I was like, "Okay, I can respect that." But I kept it in the back of my mind. I'm going to record this band. Wow. I'm going to record this band. So I kept messaging them, kept emailing them, and we kept a relationship going for about three months. So I finally convinced them to come to the studio. I said, just give me 80 bucks. That's all. I just want 80 bucks. I don't <laughs> I'm just a guy, and I just want $80. That's all yeah. I need. <laughs> and uh, they agreed to do that. So we did the EP for 80 bucks. <laughs> um, and they got signed. And, wow. Uh, they didn't know where to go after that, so they just came back it, to work with B because the – you know the relationship we had built yep. and the experience that they had they loved it so much there so we just went with that um and the label was cool with it and that was my first label project so i, I got yeah. lucky in a sense i was in the right place at the right time uh -huh. but at the same time i had put in all those hours to kind of you know figure out you know how to get comfortable with this and get comfortable enough to the point where I was willing to charge money for to do this for somebody else. So. Oh man, uh, that's that's amazing. Um, there's a couple things here that stick out that are amazing. So one is, you you got good at this by just fiddling. Absolutely, trial and error. Yeah. Playing around, not. I didn't understand a compressor for years. I just knew that if I put the compressor on the voice and turn this knob like this, um, that it would sound different and better to me so yeah. now of course i know how a compressor works because i design them now but uh when i started out i had no clue and 
I, years gone by without even using a click track. Just no idea how to use a click track. No care. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I just, love I love that though because you're you're just fiddling till it sounded good. Um, you're discovering, you're learning by just, well. You're a musician, you know what sounds good and doesn't, and you keep tweaking. So I love that determination. I love also that you uh, you had the guts to when people reached out at the very beginning after that first recording you did with your band when they reached out, you had the guts to say, yeah, come over. I guess I'll record bands now and. That that's where you got your experience. It seems like that prepared you for the Devil Wears Prada EP. Yeah, you know what um, attributed to that really was just me wanting to have more experiences. I wanted more material to work on. I didn't want like my band would have to write more songs in order right. for me to record more things more frequently. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it was like, wow, this is a great opportunity for me to sort of, <laughs> uh, I guess, test my my knowledge on someone else's stuff and not have to worry about the result <laughs> no kidding dude <laughs> so, i love i love that i mean it's it's real simple right it's fiddling till it sounds good it's putting in hours i mean so much of this you get good at a craft because you just keep doing it and that's how you just when you finish a project you, you learn something every time and you were learning what i also love though about your deal with devil Wars prada when they came and you saw them live was you got the gig because you went up and talked to them Absolutely. And then yeah. you continue to talk to them. Can you describe – that may not be natural for some of the people watching this. They may not realize that like they might think people need to come to them somehow. Why am I not getting opportunities? I mean that's what's separated you I think from maybe someone who wouldn't have just gone up and said, hey, I want to record you. Yeah, I mean um, you know, the, the conversation exactly is a little hazy in my head right now. But I can sure. say that I wasn't pushy but I was still very – proactive and very interested and I would continue to show my interest by I think you know maybe I would say hey I learned this new trick about how you can re-trigger kick drums and they sound better check out an example and I would be keeping up with them wow and 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 kind of knowing that they were interested in recording helped because I was I could give them tips and they were like wow. man this guy actually knows a lot more than us wow that's huge Joe I mean so you're I hope people are catching this. This is great because you, um, one, you you reached out to them because you love their music. I love that because that's what gave you the desire. Like, oh, I have to record these guys because what they're doing musically is awesome. So you were engaged and you actually wanted to work on their music. So you almost wanted to come alongside them and partner with them because you wanted to hear their music more and be a part of it. So I love that. And then I also love what you said that you were just trying to educate them. I mean, that was almost your sales pitch without realizing it was you were like you're displaying your expertise in a way, which was, I like this stuff. I'm constantly learning. Check out what I can do. This could help you. This could help you. And they were sold on the fact that this guy's persistent. He seems to really like our music, and he knows a lot about recording. And he keeps like bugging us. And uh, and then you offered him a sweet deal, which is always a good idea if you're trying to work with someone that you really want to work with, and if it gets them in. But that's I I just think that. There's a lot to be said about your approach of being persistent because you loved their music and wanted to work with them. And a lot of people maybe are a little afraid to actually go to a show, see a band, and say, hey, I have a recording studio. It's kind of old school approach where you go talk to real people and uh, try to work with them. Yeah, and you don't need to necessarily you know, walk up to somebody and go, here's my business card, and then walk away. Like you, What you want to do is establish rapport with someone and, yeah. and say, like, man, that was a great set. I love your songs. Like this is the kind of stuff that I want to record right now. It's so yep. interesting to me, and I, I really think that we could do something cool together. If you're ever interested, just give me a call. You know, just uh, Sometimes it, it, it can be a little alarming to just cold approach somebody, but I've, I've noticed that there's definitely um, different settings for different types of approaches. And I know, like for example, at a show, there's a lot of high energy. So having a high energy approach uh, is is welcoming there in that situation. Now, if you're at an event and everyone's just kind of chill, you don't want to walk up to somebody and be like, "Hey, I'm really cool at recording and let's let's work together and yeah. let me tell you why I'm awesome." Uh, that might be alarming and and not not the right way. So, I would say um also don't be, you know, be patient. You it might take a long time to get a client. You might have to talk to them for months, even years before they're willing to consider 
uh, trusting you with their art. And that's a really big responsibility. Yeah. So I didn't really know all that at the time. And I got lucky in the way that I kind of handled myself. But I had put the project kind of on a pedestal because I was like, man, this is this is exactly what I want to do right now. So I better not mess this up. And mm. uh, I was very careful with how I handled it. So I love it. Awesome. What uh, if I can ask on that EP in particular that ended up getting them signed and getting you your first real label gig and kind of propelling you forward? What what kind of gear were you using on that record at your buddy's studio? Man, this do you is... remember any of it? I would love. I, would love to <laughs> I remember. It's just embarrassing. But uh... oh no, there's no embarrassment here. This this website's called the Recording Revolution. I champion cheap gear, so go yeah, for it. Yeah. Well, uh, I remember specifically having these Behringer AKA tube preamps. Um, the thing that's really funny about those preamps is they weren't actually tube preamps, um, but they had a little tube in there. Yeah, it's not a, really. With a light behind it. With a light behind it, it yeah. <laughs> I have those too. Yeah, so I, I was using those. Uh, I was I didn't have enough channels to do a whole drum set, so I was taking all of my Tom signals into a Behringer mixer mm -hmm. and summing that down to one mono um, excuse me, one mono uh, track. I, I, I didn't even have stereo toms, so it was no panning on the toms. Uh, Love it. Love it. Yeah. And what I actually ended up doing um, to pan my toms is I would go in and cut every tom hit and put oh. it on three different tracks and then just pan, pan the tracks. Pan them. <laughs> it's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, I did really weird stuff like that. I mean, my kick drums, I would just like, I'd take like one really good kick hit and then just like visually copy and paste. And since I wasn't on a click track, I couldn't go by a grid. So I no. was just lining up waveforms. Oh, that's miserable. It was brutal. I mean, it would, it would take like six hours to do like one or two songs. So wow, it's crazy. Um, it, we're talking about gear, though. So uh, yeah. basic dynamic mics on the drums, you know, the whatever the guy had. He had like a B-52 you know, S SM57, you know, the basics. We had these Chinese octavas for the overheads, uh -huh. um, which I had the little screw-in capsules, and you could change, like, the yep. shapes and, and uh, of the pickup response. And uh, all that would just go into an interface. I think the first interface we used was something called Aardvark Q10. Oh, yeah. You remember that? Oh, yeah. So that was a PCI-based card. Yep. Um, had I think it had ten channels or something like that, and uh, that's pretty much all I had. And I was using Cubase um, SX3. And you're still a Cubase guy, right? Yeah, I'm on Cubase yeah. six point five. I know they've gone up to eight now, and I just haven't. Um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But uh, amen. <laughs> but I, I like I like Steinberg. Um, I was on New Window in the early days for a while too, but that was only because they had progressed the programs diff at different times. And right. So at that time, I needed what was what this was doing. So, um, uh, New Window is more useful for movies and stuff. Yeah. So, so that's that was the basics, and I would do di direct in on guitars. There was a couple of albums when I first started out where I had to amp, uh, had to micro you know, mic up a cab and stuff. So that was just the basics, you know, microphone into the Behringer, into the computer. And they had whatever amp they had, 5150 with a cab or, or whatever. Sure. But then, uh, you know, as I got money and stuff, I went out and bought like a pod, uh, the little bean. Yeah, oh, yeah. To start right out with. Guy, yeah. And uh, went crazy with that thing until I decided I need the rack unit and got the rack unit and... Uh, the rest was history, I think, really. <laughs> I just kind of went on that tirade for a long time until I started basically going completely in the box, and then now I design my own plugins. <laughs> I love it. Uh, you're using Behringer tube preamps uh, and an Aardvark interface and running stuff direct and recording to Cubase on a PC in your buddy's garage and uh, <laughs> and then the band gets signed. So maybe the takeaways would be that it's a combination of it, it's the gear was not the equation. It was you had 
a good idea of what you wanted to do, how to use the gear, and did whatever it took to get the sounds right, including chopping up a mono-summed tom track and making it multiple tracks, and then manually sample replacing your own kick drums by eye. And then, you, so your dedication and your craft, plus a really talented band with really good songs that played well, probably, and not, nothing in there was a piece of gear as the as the the main crux as to why they got signed or why the, the EP did well. So, what would you say since we were talking about gear? I know you know things have changed a little bit. You've got your own place. You've been able to do a lot more work since that first EP. But what is uh what does your setup look like today? You say you're completely in the box. You still are doing recording and mixing. Right? Yeah. So, uh, what what's some of your favorite maybe your favorite gear and sort of what your core setup is is comprised of today? Well, as far as mixing goes, I am 100% in the box, so I'm not using any outboard compressors or any kind of analog gear. Mm-hmm. Um, what I mix on is I just have the Cubase. I've got the plugins. That goes into my RME Fireface, which mm-hmm. I use for an interface. And then that goes to a central station to control my monitoring. And then for monitors, I'm using the Atom A7Xs. Uh, I used to preach about referencing. Um, I still think re- if you're not experienced and not, um, you know, you haven't done tons of records, I still say that you should have another set of speakers that you can reference to. Mm-hmm. The reason why is because levels and dynamics will change on speaker size, uh, especially on consumer speakers that were built for computers. Yeah. Um, you know, everything gets smaller, and so a lot of changes happen when that happens. So I used to have these uh, Bose, I think they're called RE20 or, or Bose 20, C20, something like that. Uh, you can get them at Best Buy. I would uh, reference back and forth to those, just have it on a little switch so I can yep. check out the different. And then uh, the other thing, you know, is just I always work out of homes. I don't really mix a lot in studios. So... I feel like my ears are sort of adjusted to the reality of what's in my session, mm. um, not necessarily what's happening in my room, where I know there's a lot of guys who will jump on a rig, and they're just so in tune with like how their room sounds and how it all you know, vibes together that they can get great results, and then you take them out of that environment, put them somewhere else, and they, they completely die they lose it so for me i've always mixed in living rooms and bedrooms and garages and stuff so i my strength i think is just making more i guess big moves and not really vibing off the room Mm. i'm doing things very surgically i'm doing things very scientifically very precisely and that's how i'm getting my sound versus someone who might kind of play around with knobs and just, you know, dig on on how the room pushes and pulls. Uh, I'm I'm looking at things on graphs. I'm using my ears. I'm lo- using headphones. I'm using reference speakers. I'm using monitors. I'm checking it in my car, you know, uh, listening to it in mono, uh, bouncing it into, like, a crappy MP3 and comparing it to the wave and, like, just doing all those things. That's how mm. I'm getting my results for mixing. Um, Love it producing or recording i don't have a drum room of my own i used to but it started to bother me my living situation uh, Mm -hmm. when i would have to record the drums in my house and everybody in the house would have to be quiet and turn the tvs off and oh you got to listen to this loud snare drum all day and uh just didn't work so uh i started recording drums in in actual professional studios and that kind of upped my game a bit, too, because I had access to a lot of gear that I didn't own. So you go to the studio, and they've got all these nice microphones and this nice room. And, you know, so you can do these really elaborate setups that you wouldn't be able to do in your own home. So I do drums that way. And then I bring them all back into the stu- you know, back into my house and the studio there and cut them all up and manipulate them and go crazy and add samples and stuff. So. Yeah. And then uh, for guitars and vocals, I just do them right here, right in this room. I don't have a vocal booth. I just have the vocalist set up a you know, microphone like right over here. And I can turn around and talk to him, and he can talk to me, and the communication is instant. instant. And uh, I wear headphones, and he wears headphones, and we just go at it like that. And uh, we'll record guitars sitting right here, uh, punch 
you know, punch in all the parts and edit it all together. And uh, we do direct input for the guitars, and I use, actually now I use my own plugins for guitar mixing, but uh, before that I would use just Pop Farm, yeah. and I have the Waves plugins, pretty much all of the Waves plugins, and uh, that's it. It's a pretty basic setup. It's all about, for me, it's all about performance and attention to detail. Mm. Um, the biggest thing being attention to detail, listening to every single chord, every single note, mm. every single performance um making sure that it's completely exactly what you want and realizing that it's permanent so whatever is going into there is going to be uh i like to say uh people die but songs live on forever and mm. that's you know once you've put that song out in the world and someone's heard it that's either in their head or it's you know you can listen to it a million times so i i like to make sure that the the art that's being captured is the best it will ever sound uh in the recording i love it i i I think you're um you're a little bit maniacal in a really good way if i can use that word in a good way that you very persistent to make the craft and the art like you said as perfect as it can be the attention to detail i think is huge uh it's hard sometimes personalities might be a little bit more add and like get bored i got to move on but it probably takes a little bit more dedication to hang in there and analyze everything especially in your genre i would say it seems like every Every kick drum hit is is precise. Every guitar is clean and precise in terms of its, you know, especially the the tight palm muted stuff. Um, anyway, I, I love it. I think the attention to detail is huge. And and again, I hope people are hearing that nothing you said really was gear specific. Like the attention to detail isn't a piece of gear. Anybody can have attention to detail, and some things might take longer than others. And and if it's if it gets the sound you want, then it's worth it. That's great. Yeah, and I think one of the first steps into uh it, let's say right now you're still not you know in that space where you have uh you know the approach that i have to attention to detail i think one of the first exercises that i really started noticing myself doing naturally was to listen to a song and as soon as something happened that i didn't like i would stop and I'd say, all right, what, why? Why is that happening right now? I want to go through every track, starting with track one, all the way down. Okay, there's a weird sound right there in that snare microphone. Why is that there? Why did that happen? How do, how do I make sure that doesn't happen again? How do I fix that? And until I got to the point where I could have a song play through and my ears wouldn't yell at me and say, hey, there's something weird there. So once I heard the song all the way through and it was nice, um, that that was good for me. So uh, I still have that. And what what it's to the point now where it's really annoying because I can't really enjoy a lot of uh-huh. a lot of stuff. As someone will sit here and perform with you know in front of me, and everything that's going through my head is like, uh, you missed that chord. Oh, that note was early. Uh, you didn't you know you held that that string down too hard. Uh, oh yeah, those kind of things are running through my head, and I'm like almost like listening past what's actually being mm. thrown at me. It's like I can hear like the matrix of the sound <laughs> or something. I hear all this other stuff that's not supposed to be there. So Pulling uh, bullets out of the sky. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. No, yeah. I, I mean, because there's a, there's a tension there between what, the benefit of what you're saying and the persistence, the attention to detail is that you can get a song perfect. But the n- negative side of that is that you can almost miss the forest for the trees. You're so zeroed in on that when really maybe the average listener will go, that vibe's really cool and they like it. And there is something imprecise, but you could be maybe a little too dialed in sometimes. Right. There is a very big responsibility mm. in, in balancing what I'm talking about because you can look at a guitar part and say, okay, you know, in between every strum, you're moving your hand up. And sometimes you're missing the strings, sometimes you're hitting them hard, sometimes you're hitting them soft. I, so if you have like the analytical brain and you're thinking of attention to detail, you're like, oh, well, every strum should be 100% velocity. Da, 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 da. Okay, so now that doesn't sound musical anymore. Right. So you have to balance it where you're like, okay, this would sound better if it was a little bit more on time, but I'm going to keep those up strums a little off because that's what's musical about this riff or this part. Yeah. Uh, and you you have to 
the, the only way you can really figure out how that works is trial and error and listening to a lot of music and working with a lot of people and just building up experience. You can't really teach like, well, what's the right way to play this guitar riff? Because you have Dave Grohl play it and it sounds this way and then you have James Hetfield play it. It sounds completely yeah. different. So uh, it's a balancing act. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to ask you about uh, metalcore in, in particular. What would you say is like one or two of the hallmarks, signature sounds of, of that genre, and uh, what are some of the things that you're doing, either, either in the recording production phase or mixing phase, that's unique to that genre to get those sounds that maybe a pop, country, regular rock record wouldn't have to use? Well, one hallmark of metalcore is what we call a breakdown. And uh, breakdowns are typically a kick pattern that's played uh, kind of usually in 16th notes and the guitar follows it and uh, it, the guitar basically is playing the exact same pattern as the kick and they're both going along the same and, and so is the bass so it's it's it becomes interesting because the problem that you have is once you get this to sound uh, very precise it, it kind of loses uh, it, it starts to become less interesting because it's so on point. But it has to sound that way because if the guitar was a little bit late and the bass was a little early and the drums are kind of not evenly spaced, you get this really big mess, right? Yeah. So it has to all line up and, and kind of syncopate. But once you've done that, now you've you've created something that's a little sterile. Mm. So one of the things that we do to, to keep it interesting is I always augment breakdowns with little sounds that can make accents. Mm. So, for example, if you have like a pattern that's like da 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 you notice how when I did that, I went da 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 So those two hits are like little accents. So what mm. I could do is I can take a kick drum that has a little bit more bass and a little bit more top end than than the other kick drums and I actually put it on another track and put it on those two beats got it as a layer and so when you listen to this now it sounds like the drummer like hit the kick drum really hard on those yeah. two hits and that creates this really cool like da 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 da, -da and you get this nice little motion Head going on yeah. and then you can go into the guitar tracks and you can do little volume automations, just tiny ones that kind of emphasize certain little hits. And uh, I'm going through and doing that on a mass scale on every track, wow. just all kinds of little augmenting. And, and uh, that's how you can really make something that's so sterile and so syncopated sound more interesting. Um, that's cool. And, you know, that goes all the way down to how I produce vocals. I will do like let's say I do doubles for the whole song and then like when I want certain words to be more powerful I'll add another two tracks or maybe I'll have this the vocalist do like two high screams and two low screams mm. combine those together to make a more powerful statement on that word or Got that it. line and uh, so it's a it's just layering lots and lots of layering kind of like what you would do in Photoshop you know yeah you take a, a normal flat drawing you black and white looks interesting. Now you add gray and you've got shadows. Okay, now it's a little more interesting. Okay, now you start to add textures and things. So if you're gonna think of audio in that way, whereas like a guitar player can play guitar part and that's interesting enough, but if you were to take another guitar and play the same thing an octave up and kind of sneak it in there, now you've added a more interesting layer that makes it sound bigger. Mm, and I think what you just said at the end, the sneak it in there, and you said with the automation too, subtle automation moves is enough to to give it what you're talking about as opposed to like multiple layers and they're all the same volume <laughs> and I, just, yeah and i look at it like this it's like anybody can record this guitar part so how am i going to do it that makes it me mm. and and that's my little s trademark or my signature is that the way that my brain is like thinks about layering and how i think about how i can put twists on sounds to make it my own independent version my own unique version uh that's i think what people come to me for Oh, that's great. And I love what you said there too, because so many of the guys and gals watching who are maybe newer, 
you know, when you start out recording and mixing, you ask these types of questions like, how do you get a good drum sound or a good bass sound? Or how are you supposed to mix the very blanket statements as if there is one way to do something. And, and as you develop, what you're describing is not just how to get a good sound, but how do you get a sound that you like that's unique to the way you hear things. So you're creating your own sound, which is the beautiful part of what we do. It's an art form. And that takes a little bit maybe more confidence um, to say it like that, but it's also more freeing because then you don't have to copy someone's sound. You can say, well, how do I like to hear drums or how do I like to produce vocals? And uh, it's almost more fun that way. So I, I, I'm always encouraging the, the younger guys to think about in terms of what do you like drums or guitars or vocals to sound like, not just what is the right way to do it. Yeah, and, and assuming that everyone assuming that everyone knows how to record, what are you going to do that's different? Because yeah. every like once you know the basics and you got it down, what's next? Um, so I, I like to layer, and that's that's kind of my thing. Um, sometimes I'll also get a little. Uh, uh, I'll try and like, you know, mix odd sounds that really shouldn't go together, and see if I can make them work as like a challenge. I love um, it. And sometimes that puts you in a uh, creative space where you f- figure out things that you never would have thought of. So. That's um, awesome. I think the mindset definitely should be not how do I, how do like wh- what am I supposed to use or how am I supposed to turn this attack knob or how am I supposed to set the threshold? How about set the threshold and see where that takes you? And if you think there needs to be more, then try more. If you think there needs to be less, then try less. And it's all sort of relative to your experience. Now, the way I might set a compressor, uh, compressor might be wrong, but look at what it's done for me. I, yeah. I've sold a lot of records and a lot of people really enjoy um, how it sounds. So that, at the end of the day, is all that matters. It doesn't matter if you know exactly how to put the threshold and what the right way to do it is. What matters is, does it sound good and do people like it? That's You guys heard it from Joey himself. It's great. No, it's simple, but sometimes that's what we need because we get off track with things that are surround maybe the core of what good recording and mixing is and you just summed it up does it sound good and do other people agree do they like it as well yeah that's awesome i love it um can we can you talk about your plugins i want i want i don't know if everyone knows that you have an entire company joey sturgis tones uh, um dedicated to some software plugins and products you've created that are pretty unique um explain what they are, maybe some of the ones you like, why you started them, and uh, I mean, give an idea is why, why more plugins. Everybody's making plugins, you know. There's a million to choose from. Why, why your plugins, and why did you want to create some something unique? Well, the the it all starts with my mission. I think the reason why I'm here uh, is to help people make great music. I think that's my mission in life. So. Um, I never really knew that until I started doing all these these different things, and I started to have connections between like you know I would do a creative live and then I would do a Skype critique and then I would do a podcast and then I would record a band and I'm like wait a minute I'm helping people make better music that's that's my mission here so it all ties into that um, and the reason why I think I'm so passionate about it is that I I feel like I I feel like producing isn't enough creative outlet for me to help people do that part of my mission so I wanted to create my you know there was there was these situations where I'm like man I every time I compress a vocal I do this this and this Mm. and I'm always loading this preset so that I can do this this and this and this this and this so I I was like man I wish I could just create my own plugin that would do those three or four or five things so that it's all in one place and now it's easy for me to you know, drag it over here and copy and paste it here and, and open it quickly here. So uh, I did a whole bunch of research on the internet, um, tried to, and, you know, I had the programming background, so I, I wasn't That's com- true. completely shy to how that how software development works. So I put together my own prototype and started testing it on projects uh, in my own time. I wasn't doing it in front of the client. I didn't want to waste their time. So on my time, I was testing this stuff. Once I finally got something where I was like, wow, this is starting to sound actually kind of better than Hmm. what I normally do, Um, that's when I contacted Boz, which, uh, you know, 
uh, a lot of people know that he helped me kind of start the company. So he, he created the first four plugins and, and now we've gone on to do many others. But, um, you know, he, he was able to take my sort of, he was kind of like a producer to me. Mm. He, you know, I, I came in and said, I want a compressor that does this and this is how I'm doing it right now. And can we find a, a better way and how can we improve it and all this. And so he was like, okay, let me take a look at what you've done and I'll, I'll, I'll play around with it. And we came up with gain reduction. And at the time, I was selling pod farm presets because so many people were asking me, how do you get that pod farm tone? Yeah, I was, I was like, all right, here's the preset. Yeah. Just check it out. Learn from it. I mean, don't, don't just open the preset and use it. Like, look at how I set up the chain of the signal and, and how I tweak the knobs and all this and make your own version. I was doing that, and that was actually doing pretty well, like to the point where it was kind of funding the development of That's gain cool. reduction. And so... Um, game reduction. We finished it and we put it out, and it blew up. It was a massive success, and that's how Joyster's tone started. And then that got my mind thinking of, oh, I can create all kinds of plugins. That you know, at first it was just, I'll just make this one plugin. It'll be cool. But then, you know, I'm an entrepreneur too, so I get extremely interested in all of the challenges that. Now you know. Now we we have meetings about advertising and marketing and and remarketing and retargeting and uh, you know we get yeah. crazy into this stuff because that I just find it interesting. So, um, on the plugin side, what I think we do really well is we take the uh, analytical scientific part of it out of the equation and just make these tools creative. Mm. Uh, we what we want people to do is we want to we want them to open our plugins and make music. We don't want them to s learn about compression by using a compressor or, you know. So the whole idea is to empower creators and, and take that, that barrier that you have. Like, there's a barrier where a guitar player has this riff idea in his head. He's been humming it all day and he's like, man, I can't wait to sit down and play guitar and have this riff recorded because this is a cool riff. And then the first thing he does, he sits down at a computer. He has to, how do I, okay, I got to create a project. Uh, okay, now I got to figure out the tempo. Okay, open guitar rig. Uh, what amp do I want to use? Uh, okay, this one sounds weird. That one doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound right. And he's, sooner or later, he spent two hours and he hasn't even recorded the riff. Yeah. And I find a big problem in that. And uh, I know the way that my mind works musically is that when I have an idea, I've got literally 30 seconds to get that recorded yeah. somewhere before it disappears. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I wanted to make tools that uh, allowed people to get these ideas out quicker and to have the final result sound, you know, production worthy. Uh, and I, you know, now I'm using these tools to actually mix records and to That's you so know cool. put them into my actual process. Yeah, I mean, guys, Joey's got. I mean, gain reduction, like he was saying, is a compressor as it were i don't want to just say it's just a compressor but it's a compressor that has a button called slay has a knob called slay so you turn <laughs> the slay up and it, you, you slay the vocal you get more compression it's awesome i mean it's um you get an aggressive vocal sound quickly um so it's something as simple as that like put it on vocals and get that he's got a transient designer which is multi-band which is cool because then you can you can like really zero in the tone of the transient designer a little bit more than your typical one um, Tone Forge, you've got Drum Forge and Kick Forge. I mean, you got drum sound stuff going on too. So um, people can go to joeysturgistones.com? Yep, joeysturgistones.com for my audio plugins. Also, if you do go to that URL, there's a, a menu option called Drums. And if you click on that, that actually takes you to another thing that I'm doing called Joey Sturgis Drums, where you can actually buy my drum samples. Uh, uh, drum samples awesome. that I've created uh, for myself, and I've used them on recordings. And then, um, if you want to check out the other company that creates uh, interesting drum products, it's called DrumForge.com. Um, go check out his his products, Joey Sturgis Tones. For one, two reasons. One, uh, they sound good. I have them. I've just just started to play with them. They sound really, really good. They are exactly like he's describing. Joey's saying that they they're not your traditional labeled knobs so if you just don't like the technical side of things which i don't either i just had to learn the knobs because i wanted to get them to do what they wanted to do but you can get cool sounds quickly which is very good to stay in musician brain and not move too far into scientific engineer brain 
uh, and they're priced really, really well. They're really accessible, um, which is great. So you could pick up one plug in at a time and you're not losing an arm and a leg. So I love it. They're priced right. Um, and I'm glad you're continuing to make new products. And I love it because you're being made by a musician and a producer who's actively doing this. So guys, these aren't being made by people that don't make records for a living, you know, and some plugins are. These plugins are being made by a guy that makes records for a living and is a musician. And so it's it's as if you were going to make them yourself. So it's really, really cool. So go check out his stuff. Um, also, can I push people to your creative live classes? Yeah, um, I have done two so far. I have a studio pass where I sort of walk you through the whole process of um, analyzing songs and writing music and pre-production and, and uh uh, all the way down to how to record the song and then how to mix the song and then how to post produce the song which is kind of like to add flair salt and pepper yeah. so that that's a nice little whole encapsulated thing on that creative live as well as at the end I kind of talk about some workflow stuff like here's how you can be more efficient in the studio okay. and how you can be more efficient in uh, managing your projects and then my second creative live was a closer, more detailed look at actual mixing, the actual process of mixing, how there's different styles of mixing where some people will, when they mix a song, they just use the audio that they're given. Other people will layer in their own audio. And I've also known there's some famous mixers that will pick up a guitar and put those little octaves in there. Uh, to make stuff sound bigger. And I cover all three of those in that course as well. And then um, if you've checked out all the plugins and you've uh, you've done the creative lives and you're still wanting more, we have a podcast as well. Mm -hmm. And you can find that at jsfpodcast.com. And uh, we talk to people like Graham. We talk <laughs> to people like Stephen Slate, Bob Katz, uh, uh, Andrew Wade, uh, Jamie King, uh, cool guys that are just really nerds like us they, they're into the craft and they like to talk about it and that's what we do on the show and we try to educate you and, and enlighten you into different worlds and different ways of thinking about how to do audio and how to work with people and how to work with audio so uh, it's a really interesting show uh, check it out if you're, if you're really into podcasts yeah I can say it's very very good the hosts were very gracious when I was on the show so yeah Tons of Thank material out there to check out. Um, definitely check out Joey's Creative Live classes. Um, Creative Live in general is a great organization. Um, they do they have great material, um, and I'm honored to have shared the stage with you as as it were. But your classes look awesome, uh, and then the plugins, of course. Um, this has been awesome, and you've been so generous with your time. I, if you don't mind, I'd love to ask one final thought from you. There's a lot of people watching um, who are getting the idea that nowadays it is possible to uh, kind of chart their own path and make a career in music um, without the traditional, I have to go to an audio school, I have to get an internship, I have to be mentored by someone who's famous. There's actually more opportunity now. Some people say there's fewer opportunities. There's almost more opportunity now than ever before for someone like you or me who was just a musician that got into recording to chart their own path and make music for a living. Um, but and hopefully this interview has been encouraging to them that it's possible in another way. But what would you say if you had to leave one piece of advice for the young at heart, doesn't matter what their age is, but a lot of these guys are getting out of reti retiring even and wanting to start a new career. What would you say to a young at heart producer that wants to make a living doing music? What is one piece of advice that might help them in staying the course and maybe seeing some success doing this? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, I would say the the big thing that you can do is just focus on um, don't focus on the, uh, the the tools and focus more on the ideas because I think like there's we're in an interesting time period right now where um, music is changing a lot and the whole industry and business around music is changing so there's all these new concepts where you can fit in. I feel like there's more independent content creators, there's more people on YouTube that have a band that like literally lives on YouTube. They don't like there's YouTube people who tour now, which is pretty crazy. Yeah. So like think keep your mind tuned to new ideas. 
uh, you could find a career just mixing a YouTube show. You could find a career uh, recording covers for YouTube artists or helping them make their covers sound better. There's all these opportunities now, and just keep your mind open. Uh, you don't have to go the traditional route. You don't have to record uh, record label projects. You don't have to win Grammys and get platinum records. There's this whole other awesome side to this industry where basically driven by YouTube and also uh, social media. So I would say um, keep your mind open and, uh, it, and uh, do your homework. And if you're really interested in this and you're really passionate, self-motivation will take you so far. Uh, my whole career is literally thanks to self-motivation. Um, it's not like I... I you know, went to school, acquired a bunch of debt, and then was like, okay, I've got to make money now. Um, it was like, hey, I, I want to know how to make drums sound more powerful. And that's what drove my career, not not this uh, urge to to make money or to uh, even pay back debt or anything like that. Mm. So hopefully, um, you know, hopefully if you're interested and you stay interested and you really just keep putting in the time and the energy, I think it will pay off because eventually you'll do something that somebody will will be willing to pay you for. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I think you're spot on. And I hope I hope everyone watching has taken what you've said, some of the things we've talked about today, and uh, and maybe it's taking them to another level of thinking what's possible. And uh, I appreciate you sharing your story. You're a really down-to-earth guy. You're fantastic at what you do, and you're an encouragement to me and everybody in this space that's making music. And uh, you're a champion of, of musician-driven, home studio, organically grown, uh, music-focused people in the industry as opposed to profit-focused people. Nothing wrong with profit. You gotta gotta make a profit. To you put gotta live. The table. Gotta live. <laughs> making money's not bad, but when the music is centered, uh, so much more awesome stuff can happen and you're a good example of that so thank you thanks joey for hanging out with us and sharing your wisdom and taking time out of your in a very busy schedule to make this happen you're so welcome thank you so much for having me and uh thanks guys for watching and and thanks for having interest in in audio because we're we're a small group of guys so let's let's all get together and do cool things love it thanks joey thank you so much